good to go, Graham. So, so I would just like good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody. <coughs> okay. Good, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another of the o Overberg Geoscientist Group um, Zoom presentations. And today we have um, Graham Gavin on the platform to speak to us. Um, Graham did the the, 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 the study route of good geologist. He was a Natal and then UCT graduate. Um, and then he has 45 years in exploration, mining, mine development. And he's been from, from the, the, the large company end all the way through to, to the, the, the small company end. So for example, he cut his teeth, I think, with Ang Deval, where he met Henny and a number of people in the audience. He's also worked for for gold fields and and Anglo Gold Ashanti, and and then he has a very impressive CV which covers a large number of countries, activities, and 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 employment was with smaller companies, junior companies. So he's well versed to speak to us about the vits today. He's going to talk about this amazing gold deposit we have, which is. Um, I think sadly um, approaching rapid decline, and and we've seen. I don't know if any of you followed the junior mining in Darba again in the last two days, run by Bernard Swanepoel, and there were some notable um, uh, appearances by our mines minister shooting down some of the existing mining incumbents, and maybe we can just pick up on that at the end, or we'll pick it up in the panel discussion and the message that sends out to potential investors. Anyway, thanks, Graham. We look forward to your presentation and some discussion at the end of it. Um, so go for it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, let me see. Okay. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Let me just end that show. So you can give us a, that one, you can give us again on another time, eh? Yeah. Right. Is, is that clear? I mean, yeah. everyone can hear my voice. Yes. Okay. Then, Topic then... that I've got. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I've, the demise of the gold mining sector. John said lost opportunities. I've added in missed opportunities. Um, <clears throat> if one drives through Carlton World, Clarkstorp and the Free State Golders, this uh, sort of major headgear is very familiar. It's the Anglo Gold headgear. It probably represents, you know, the peak of, of gold mining um, in this country. These are pretty large shafts, and it represents the fact that we had some of the, well, the deepest mines in the world. And for production purposes, these were, as I say, pretty big shafts. I think, from my experience, two man hoists, two rock hoists, and invariably a, a service um, uh, hoist as well. Um, Designed for deep level mining and moving an awful lot of, of rock. Okay, so aim of overview, I, I did try and summarize it, and I just I think the best way to look at it is how did the gold mines get to the current situation in 2020? Um, I'm going to just run through overview of the discovery, um, exploration effort, the history of discovery, the development of the mines, um, the 80s exploration boom, and then obviously post-1976 when everything started to change in the country, we had sort of major political, socio-economic um, upheavals, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is probably the era where there was sort of a, a serious decline in interest in the, in the, in the Wirtz mines. Then I'll just trace through things that went through in the 90s and then sort of outline how I see, uh, you know, the factors that led to, uh, you know, the, the situation as we've got it now. And then I'll just go briefly through Barbets, and I think that's sort of pertinent as well. Okay, it's just a couple of uh, T's and C's here. One of the things, obviously, I've got my own experience here. I've gone through a lot of uh, geological information in the public domain. And obviously, the decisions that are made about development are with, within the boards and the executive of the relevant uh, companies. Okay, four references. I've gone through quite a bit here. 
John Handley's book from 2004 has been a, a fascinating insight. I've also used Antrobus's um, 86 volume. And then I've picked up in the Geological Society archives, Frost et al. 43, Borches and White 46, Baines 47, and then various um, company press releases, reserve and resource statements, and of course the 86 uh, mineral deposits volume. So, okay, where did this start? Um, in 1896, the main reef was discovered at Long Lata by George Walker and George Harrison. Um, in John Handley's book, he, there is a view that he that apparently is sort of quite relevant, but been overlooked from an historic point of view, is that the claim now that the first gold was discovered by the Steuben brothers. And on the inside back cover of John Handley's book, is a sort of a rough sketch as it was at the time when the Struben brothers were walking out those art crops. <clears throat> and when I started reading John Handley's book, the front piece actually had a very, very relevant um, comment um, by Des Pretorius. And I've repeated it here, and I'll let you guys read it. I did have the uh, the good fortune once to listen to Des Pretorius talk about mineralization in uh, Proterozoic basins. Uh, incredible mind, incredible command of the English language, um, obviously um, spoken as well as written. And I think he was actually a guy who actually looked very seriously at the Witz Basin. Well, I mean, the poor man passed away, what, 22 years ago? But uh, I still think that these workers is, is pioneering. So, okay, um, this is a photograph of the site of Long Arctic. This is taken somewhere in the 70s. Uh, it, I think at this point it was a national monument. And obviously, we can see in the background Joburg, which is a major metropolitan area that, that was developed and came about because of the discovery of gold. I did decide, as this, my next point is, for many years I drove down this road, Main Reef Road, and I never took the time just to pop in here and have a look, <coughs> and I regret that today. I, as we know, a lot of things have fallen into disuse in this country, and I went in on Google Maps a couple of days ago, and Unfortunately, the image is not that clear. I had heard that some company had come in here and mined those outcrops. I think this is a, probably a winter image. There's quite a bit of shadow there. And it looks as if yeah, somebody has come in and mined out that main reef, main reef leader uh, in this area. And I think it's an absolute travesty, but I suppose um, not surprising. I did think about what a lost opportunity was. Uh, probably um, could, this could generate a bit of discussion. I said where a project has gone to the point where there's a model, a resource estimate, a feasibility study, but there are factors which basically have affected the, the decision to go ahead. And I said, well, firstly, beyond the control of the company, well, the company views it and just says, basically, are there too many obstacles, too many events, or there are more attractive investment opportunities elsewhere in the world, or I don't know, maybe even a total lock, uh, um, lack of interest. Now, to have a look at this uh, photograph by courtesy of Bruce Kencross, uh, the carbon leader at Col Coltonville is probably one of the, the most spectacular reefs around. It is renowned for carrying extremely high gold grades. While there's no scale here, I'll just sort of estimate that could be anywhere between six and eight centimeters thick. Obviously we see very, very abundant gold associated with the carbon seam. Closer to home from, for me, and Henny should recognize this, uh, wild reef, Hardebeersfontein gold mine, uh, Stillfontein fasces, very, very uh, thin reef that's probably about 12 centimeters. And my comment there is that the bulk of the gold sits on that bottom contact there with those two uh, carbon stringers. Um, and this was the mainstay of production for the Clarksdorf Goldfield. And uh, the mines there 
the mining of all reef uh, because of the nature of the reef, they managed to have very, very high extraction rates. Okay, let's move on. Um, <coughs> while the West Central and East Rand mines were being developed, the geologists at the time realized that uh, the Witz Basin was part of a far, far greater entity. And one of the reasons that they thought that is when they looked at the reefs being mined from outcrop in the Tartstorp area, uh, they realized very quickly that what the Tartstorp area reefs were, were looked like were vast, vastly different to the, the Clarkstorp, uh, to the central Rand reefs. So uh, I don't want to spend too much time here. In the 30s and 40s, there was a lot of attention given to mines in the East Rand. And from my research, new mines have been opened up up to 1940. Um, and then came the big breakthrough. Um, Kroman and Weiss, I think, um, and everyone knows about uh, the, the work that these guys did. And they brought in the use of magnetics and gravity uh, to try and work out what was present underneath cover. And these geophysical techniques contributed very significantly to the discovery of the Evander Free State and Poltonville Goldfields. And I think Consequent to that as well, once the drilling started, and something that I picked up in the two papers that were published in the transactions during um, World War II. Uh, <coughs> let's get rid of that. Um, I think it was a period of exceptional geological work. Um, I, I will show some examples now. Detailed logging, ability to set up and correlate stratigraphy, Structural interpretation, present detailed plans, sections, and boil logs, what I say, by good old fashioned drafting. And I've got some exa examples here. And I believe that the decisions that the mining house bosses of the day made their decisions on a very good geological analysis and interpretation. Okay, let's look at that. This is from Borchers and White 43. I knew the guy Baumbach uh, vaguely. I think he finished his career with goldfields in the 70s. Um, the log here is dated 1942, and it showed basically a hand-drawn log, incredible detail there. And it, uh, I think this is actually quite uh, amazing. And also, uh, this I found fascinating, that each piece of core was given a number. So these guys weren't sort of just blithely just getting the basics out and, and plotting up ball sections, putting data into databases, etc. And I must admit this to me is actually um, incredible logging. Here we just have a, a basic plan of uh, the Free State Goldfields, um, African and American, which was part of the Anglo group. Um, just you know, the, the sort of drafting, the sort of plans, uh, resonate with me, probably because I'm of the older generation. I just want to show two sections here. Uh, notice that the balls are fairly widely spaced. So the first section will be a south-north section along that line, and then a west-east section there. Um, this is the south-north section. And again, I just marvel at the, the detail and how um, very well drafted this thing, all by um, probably a parallel rule and a straight drafting. And I think this is something we miss out these days, the fact that a lot of sections and plans are generated by CAD. I think these sections for me uh, show what a geologist should be doing at early stage of exploration, hand drawing plans. The next one, unfortunately, is not very clear. It's that West East section. Um, it also shows the gravity profile, where you get a major increase in gravity in this area where the Fentersdorp lava starts thickening up. And then this was one of the reasons why the Free State came into existence, was the use of um, magnetics and gravity. Um, obviously, the West Rand group, high gravity, high magnetics, and the Central Rand group, uh, low gravity, low magnetics. And 
basically it was what are the major factors in the, in the discovery of, of those gold fields. Okay, I think let's look at this fairly quickly. The, the period of exploration between the 30s and the 50s um, led to the discovery of four gold fields. And this was an exceptional period of development of new mines. Um, and there were a lot of mines brought into production. I think the, you could say the main area was the Free State, but also Clarksdorp, Coltonville, and then the, the latecomer was Evander, because that was only discovered in the mid 50s. But a lot of gold mines came into production. And then consequent to that was the development of all the mining towns, uh, basically from Orkney and Welcome, etc., all the way through to Evander. But I think also the development of these mines had an impact on the broader economy because they needed goods and services and businesses developed uh, uh, to make um, to benefit from uh, the, the business that the, um, the gold mines uh, brought to them. So okay, we can say by the mid 60s, there were gold fields stretched probably over about 300 kilometers of strike from the free state down here. That's Oryx, uh, at least Beatrix Joel. That was the old Oryx, the, the free state gold field where the producing mines are. Clarksville, Coltonville, uh, South Deep there, all the way from the far west strand through to Heidelberg there, and then Evander in the, in the east there. Over the years, the stratigraphy has been very well sorted out. Again, over that 300 kilometers, I don't think there are very many loose ends here. And from my experience, this is where I've worked primarily, from Clarkstorp in the north, all the way down the west margin to Valcom there. So that, I'm very familiar with the stratigraphy here. And I have worked East Strand and Evander, plus um, the Bernstein project. So, okay, as I said, the 50s were a, an exceptional period for development in new mines. And this could be controversial, but I think maybe the mining houses then had a better understanding of risk, because what these guys were doing was actually sinking shafts into the central RAND group, where actually the only information they had were the, ball, uh, the balls drilled, and the interpretation based, well, well no, no seismics or any other geophysical techniques down the hole. And as I said before, the geologists stuck to the basics, no computers, observation, recognition of features, log plot, analyze, interpret. And then I've had this discussion with a couple of friends of mine, and I said, if the regulatory regime of 2020 was present post World War II, would the mining houses have listed on the gold mining companies on the JSE. Um, I think that could be controversial, but yeah, let's leave that. And then I think there was also a factor that helped the mines come into production. There were a lot of guys who returned from World War II and the mines provided them with uh, employment. And I ran into the sort of the last of these guys in the early eighties. These guys were now coming up to retirement age. And I remember one shaft mine captain who I see what he ran his shaft like clockwork. If there was a cage at nine o'clock, that cage um, was rung away at nine o'clock and it went down the mine. And uh, unfortunately, that era ended within the uh, following couple of years. So, okay, um, second phase of, of Blitz mines. <coughs> In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there were a lot of new mines um, developed from East Jefontaine Clough. Elans run to, um, through to the Free State, Massimong, Beatrix, Unicell, uh, also Cook section. The interesting anomaly at this time was that ISA, the mine was started primarily to mine for the uranium, but it didn't last very long as a result of the low uranium price. It was opened some years later to mine the Colcrun Bronze Reef, which I think is a correlative of the A Reef. And then Anglo, during that time, went through a major phase of shaft sinking um, in the Free State and Clarkstorp, and also um, Western Deeps, well, now Impening uh, Mine. 
And then there was some consolidation of the free state mines, uh, Anglo's free state mines into free gold. And then that I did pick up in my research is during this time, the 60s through to the late 70s, a lot of the older mines in the East Rand closed. So, okay, I've, these are my thoughts about just what the mines are about. They've, most of the mines became very high tonnage operations, um, deep level, generally coming up to 2,000 uh, 2, meters and deeper. Um, mining generally, well, mostly labor intensive single reef. Um, most of the gold sitting on the bottom contacts, these reefs like the Vol Reef Carbon in that allowed for high extraction rates, uh, very, very high pressure. Um, production had to be maintained. And one of the big problems that I think um, still exists is the blasting causes a lot of gold to be lost. Uh, sweeping uh, the, the fines was, in some instances, in my experience, not done. So I still think that there could be a lot of gold still lying underground, but that's, uh, you know, the, the, there's nothing we can do about that. Because of the depths, conditions at times were very hot, humid. There was the dust problem, silicosis, and the ventilation at times was um, problematic. Um, and as the mines got deeper, and this is Henny's uh, area of expertise, uh, increased seis seismic activities. Um, there were some pretty bad bumps over the years and obviously were consequence of um, injury and, and death. And I suppose it's one of the negative features of the mines, very large mine migrant labor contingent, low wages. And then to back the slot up was a huge uh, administrative function. And one of the sort of features of these mines was a very, very strict structured system, timetable. Everything was ranged around schedules, um, shaft times, uh, movement of men material during the measuring week planning. And then uh, I cynically called this lot the feudal, feudal system, king at the top and peasants at the bottom. Um, it was, um, it was, there was a rigid hierarchy. And then South Africa maintained gold production until, uh, as number one until the late eighties. Um, there was some move to introduce technology. I know that Anglo mines tried water jetting, but that led to a, a loss of gold. And then the, probably about five, six years ago, Anglo Gold of Shanti looked at using raised borers as in the horizontal mode to mine out narrow reefs. Had some advantages, but would have required a major change to mining layout and method. Okay, 1980, the gold price hit $800 an ounce and it set off a major exploration boom. Uh, JCI looked primarily at the free state of Joel and south of uh, Western areas and um, South Deep Mine. And they were successful there and they brought two new mines into production. Engelval, where I was mostly involved, the area between Lorraine and Bordeaux. I know Goldfields was busy around Colton in the Free State. I'm not too sure where else. And then Anglo Gold, both Brown and Greenfield's exploration, they looked at Evander South in the Potch Gap in the Free State. And uh, uh, there is an incredible amount of data that apparently is now available with Anglo Gold leaving South Africa. And they've uh, said their archives are available. And then in the 90s, Anglo put together what they call the BATS team, the Basin Analysis. And um, there was a lot of work done there, but obviously still in the confidential um, uh, mode. And then, of course, the most significant thing in the 80s was oil field technology, seismic surveys. I think there were two consequences of gold mining. Firstly, we, the mining industry became world leaders and we became very good at shaft sinking and mining at increased depths. Then obviously, with, ge with us geologists, the Witts Basin has been intensely studied. Um, this is just a partial list of the people who worked on it and the development of new mineralization models. Uh, hydrothermal, still 
controversial, introduced by Grattan in 1930. Um, the placerist, the sedimentologist, uh, had incredible influence through the late 70s and what into the early 90s. Uh, and then, of course, the guy I worked with for a while, Henfunter, um, in the 90s and early part of the, of the 2000s, he put out some very interesting papers um, on the Witz Basin. Okay, <laughs> I'm not sure where I got the source from. Um, it shows the production from 1886, probably in those early times, probably not very good records kept up to 2004, and I've summarized that. And this is an incredible amount of gold that has been um, produced by this basin. I don't know the US Geological Survey still estimates a very, very high proportion of world gold uh, resources still uh, existing in the in the vets, but uh, uh, I think that's where they're going to be for a long time. So, okay, what happened sort of as these mines got older? According to Handley, uh, South Africa hit peak gold production uh, over a thousand tons in 1970. And by the Late 80s, the gold production was in decline. Um, the early generation of mines, the ore reserves were declining. Um, staff were beginning to be retrenched, declining grades, increased costs. Then, of course, one of the critical things for productivity is increased distances and time spent traveling. And then in the late 1990s, uh, the gold price started to decrease and uh, mines were consolidated, um, uh, like F Gold, Anglo Gold, um, and Harmony into single companies with um, separate operating mines under that uh, umbrella. One of the things that I have discussed with a lot of guys is that while well, reefs like the Carver yeah, needed to be made. conference call. Uh, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay, can I continue there? Yeah. Okay. Um, the vol reef, the basal reef, carbon leader allowed for very, very high extraction rates, which could support high tonnage mining. And the comments that I have, or well, a lot of guys I've spoken to worked in the mines, there's the perception that the mines lack the world to look at secondary reefs. In the free state, like the leader reef, I know there would be some mining. These reefs required more geological input and they were highly channelized. Um, and I think that's probably what put off mine management. And then obviously as a mine gets older, infrastructure deteriorates, requires more maintenance. And then as I've made the point earlier, um, labor problems, political upheaval from the early eighties contributed um, to sort of, uh, making Witz mines less attractive. And I mean, uh, I think this is a little bit out of date now, because NUM was threatening a major strike uh, about a month ago. I'm not quite sure what happened there. And then one of the big issues was that there were huge increases in wages that were not matched by an increase of productivity. And as one cynical manager said, uh, the problem was that there was this approach in the mining industry appease the unions at all costs. And then obviously, as we went into the 90s and there were changes in legislation, etc., there were other factors that uh, contributed to the, the decline. Okay, let me pull that one down. Okay, this is fortunately a, a, a copy of a copy. Uh, not too clear, it shows the Clarkstorp gold fields there. It shows Woodville there, it shows northern end of the Free State Gold Fields, Allen Ridge. Um, I believe this is sort of the last frontier of its geology. Uh, that's Valdry's 10 shaft there. Uh, the next mine is there. I think that's an order of about 80 kilometers. He's been drilling done sporadically down here. Engelval had a project there, which I'll deal with now. It's very, very deep here, and I'll show a plan there. And this was sort of the area of, of um, Target Sun. 
And just schematically, these represent what we call the EA fans, and I'll deal with that shortly. There is a lot of information in company archives. If the academics could get a hold of it, I'm sure um, it would change quite a lot of thinking about the space. And I believe that one of the most critical omissions from the studies on the Witz Basin, that there hasn't been anything published about the geology of Lorraine Goldmine, which I think is an incredibly complex and interesting mine. Okay, Enderwal looked at Budaval. Um, there was a resource reported back in 96, obviously pre the resource codes, and they claimed there was 10 million ounces at six and a half grams. Pretty deep, two, three to two, six hundred meters below surface. And then, as I say, um, this is the model that was being worked on was looking for these EA fans down the west margin. So, okay, um, from the Anglo Wall press release 1996, the ground holdings that Anglo Wall had at the time, immediately northwest of Budaval, they had a project area here called Sun North. It was on the East Limb, it was deep single reefs. I'm not sure why they pursued that. Sun South plus target uh, were the main areas of interest. And where my pointer is, that's Lorraine Gold Mines. So Englewall had a pretty good ground holding. I think that's probably about 25, 30 kilometers there on strike. So, okay, um, the RB project was centered on Budaval. Uh, the concept there was this Pretorius's uh, idea of entry points. There was a lot of um, geophysical work was done. Uh, there was some structural interpretation. There was drilling carried out with varying results. Uh, the second intersection of uh, ECR was made in Boal MDM 1 in 87. And then the surprise we got was DBK 3 where it intersected Vol uh, ECR and it gave a pretty exceptional grade there, 25 grams a ton over 135 centimeters. <coughs> Englewal had a, an idea that there were EA type reefs developed there, but um, none of them have been intersected uh, so far. And uh, the exploration stopped, I think around about 89, 90. And then in a subsequent uh, press release, they claimed it was 24 million tons at 10 grams a ton. Now, uh, while the, I think the VCR intersection now is significant, uh, more drilling would be required and also confirm if there were these EAGE reefs present. But I think, let's be honest, uh, I don't think anything, well, I don't believe anything further will happen there. Okay, about this time, and I've just grouped this project, Anglo Wall and Gold Harmony. The chief geologist at Lorraine wrote a report where he said that the Lorraine Basin Margin Syncline continued northwards and was a viable exploration target. Anglo Wall, under this uh, umbrella company of Sun, started the uh, exploration. Um, and what I must emphasize here at this point is that the Lorraine geology at that point. The guys had been working there for 30 plus years. They knew what they were doing. The first borehole that was drilled was MAL1 and it intersected the full sequence of rocks. And on the basis of that, a major drilling program was initiated. And I got this from a paper that was presented at uh, a CMMI conference at Sun City in, in 94. 54 balls, 55 balls drilled, 16 long deflections, uh, 163 kilometers of core, and 180 million rand spent. And this was a pretty impressive logistical support that had to be put in place to cope with this um, amount of core uh, with the sampling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, of course, further south and Payapen one the VCR was recognized uh, basically in the Free State gold fields. Um, it was the first intersection that was reported. During this time, um, some limited 1D seismic surveys were carried out, gave the guys a, a basic idea of the structure. 
The company then started a feasibility study. Uh, drilling was ceased at about in 91. Um, the, the shift of all well, the emphasis was on target. Uh, but the resources, the potential resources were based on a number of reefs, the VCR, the EAs, which I'll um, talk about now, the A reef, the Big Pebble reef, the B reef, the Basal reef. And the EAs and the A reef, Big Pebble reefs have potential to support massive mining. And then sometime later, I think it was 93, um, the project was canned, it was obviously, as I say, Target was a major um, area of, of interest now, and they reported 11.9 uh, million ounce resource in 96, again, um, pre the resource codes. And then from a point of view of all the geologists who work there, the geology along this west margin is extremely interesting and very challenging, um, a, bit more, a lot more interesting than working on a, a single reef. So, okay, this is an abbreviated uh, stratigraphic column um, based on the clip of Friesburg there. The boulder bed's just a polymictic um, conglomerate come diamictite uh, for reasons best known to the older geologists not really looked at. This package here is the EAs. If, if you can make out there, there are a whole series of um, reefs, um, multiple reefs. In, in what they call here this package of 152 meters. The EBs, there's some reefs there, there's an EC reef, the ED reefs, the VS5 there, and then the Kimberleys here, the A reefs, the Big Pebble, um, the B reef down there, and then right at the bottom, the Basal reef. Okay, um, to sh just briefly show the complexity of the EAs, this is from north to south. You can see the package opens up and uh, you can look here yeah, that the, uh, there are quite a number of lithologies that basically repeat, uh, there are repetitive cycles in each unit. In the north, it's about 140, 150 meters thick. Down south, near three shafts, I think that's about 60 meters. But for the guys who worked on the EOs at Lorraine, um, they had to get to grasp with a very complex stratigraphy very quickly. Uh, as I've mentioned, the Lorraine Basin Margin Syncline, it has the Karoo, the Clip of Friesburg, um, that forms the interval between the base of the Karoo. Um, this here is the boulder beds. There's your EAs, your EDs, your VS5, B, B reef, base reef. Now the feature here is that it's a, an asymmetric syncline. You have a steep west limb dipping east, um, okay, this is simplified in places it's actually overturned. The overall, um, the, the east limb here um, dips generally about 15, 20 degrees to the west. And the overall plunge of the syncline is northward. So that's into the diagram at about eight degrees. And then also just, it's not shown in this um, diagram, but there are thrust faults which push progressively from the base here, pushes blocks of EAs further in, further in um, into the base and adds to some structural complexity. <coughs> the drilling and sun basically did confirm uh, the Lorraine Basin Margin Syncline. There is some complexity. I, um, I don't think the, the West Limb is as well developed as it is further south. Uh, Engelwald was also drilling on the east limb there again. I'm not, I don't understand why they were worrying about um, the, the east limb here, single reefs, where the major interest should have been there. And in this case, MAL3, the ball there, sat on that site for something like six years, uh, drilled uh, uh, one ball plus three long deflections out of it. And this feature here is a zebron back thrust. It pushes uh, the contact between the, the Vitz and the Kipperfiesberg lava. The displacement is to the west. It's essentially a flat feature. And it rises through the stratigraphy here simply because of the plunge of that northward plunge of the syncline. And when this was intersected by MAL3, it did cause quite a lot of um, rethinking of what we were dealing with there. OK. 
Okay, back in the day, this was a Sullivan 50. These rigs have been just responsible for a lot of deep drilling in, in the Vits and in the Bushveld. This was taken somewhere in the mid 80s. Um, the rod lengths here, what we call the stand, that's 18 meters. Derek probably in excess of 30 meters. And for those of us who are around, the 80s were a period of a very prolonged, very intense drought. And in the free state, we had a lot of dust storms. And uh, this was taken in October 85. If you look very carefully there, you can make out the Derek of, of a Sullivan 50. Okay, um, just to move further south, Target, uh, the company formed to take over the mineral rights north of Lorraine. The focus was the EAs and the Boral ER01 intersected the full fan. Uh, I'm not sure if my figures are correct here, but it was something like 6.5 grams over a thickness of 95 meters. And as I said, yeah, these fans, these sort of lobes, as I indicated on the one of my previous diagrams, these occurred intervals a lot at three to three and a half kilometer spacing. And there are quite a number of them from basically the far south, the Lorraine, Freddy's boundary, all the way up to one sea shaft at Lorraine, and then the Eldorado fan where Eora One was drilled, and then the Siberia Mariasdal fans. Uh, a major drilling platform was developed so that Anglerval could do uh, a pretty intensive underground drilling project to give them confidence in the resource. And then uh, the decision was made to um, start uh, to exploit the, the EAs. And it was um, done, uh, the mining is done by a massive mining trackless TM3, uh, simply because they can bulk mine um, blocks of these EAs. At, in 99, there was consideration given to sinking the shaft. I was part of the team there, but that was shelved. Uh, fortunately, one of the, this is a copy of a copy. Um, these are the EAs here, and this is just showing the composites over various reefs. Some of them are indicated here singly. Uh, yeah, they've been delineated as a, as a, as a major block. And it shows that um, the, these packages were amenable to massive mining. Uh, I'm not sure what the plans were here. And then overlying, I want to point out that we what what we call the the, the dry scale, the DKs, overlying, and this the drilling for target did um, cause some surprises when one considers the classic ideas of a Vitz reef. One of the boreholes they realized that the eight cake boulder beds, which were previously regarded as barren, um, i.e. containing no no gold that actually several horizons and reefs within contained very significant gold mineralization. And as I say, this was a, an attitude of, of a very long time, that the boulder beds were just basically ignored on, on, on all the mines. And regrettably, I can't remember the author's name here, but I did find reference to an individual who looked at the Dreyer's Kale in, um, the vicinity of Lorraine three shaft, and he reported significant gold values there, and uh, it was not followed up. Now the thinking there changed from well, we had to change from the conventional wild reef type set, um, setting to the fact that we had gold in atypical rocks, these polymetic diamectites. So we had the, con the con uh, conflict between sedimentology and the hydrothermal mo model. I'm a hydrothermalist there. Okay, that's the typical sort of polymictic um, dimictite uh, conglomerate. Uh, it's completely in conflict to the typical um, clean, mature, predominantly quartzose reef, and the gold values were over significant widths. And just to remind you, that's the classic um, Wits reef that. Uh, the sedimentologists studied and were convinced that uh, everything in all the gold in these reefs were um, 
uh, as a result of sedimentological processes. So, okay, um, 94 or 97 to 2004, there was more drilling done. Uh, there was a 3D seismic survey. Uh, it helped improve the structure. There were serious problems uh, with the model. Um, I won't go into too much detail there. We built a, from early 97, we went from nine rigs to 16 to 20 rigs by January 98. The company had cash flow problems. The company started imploding and we started just uh, incremental attrition of drill rigs. Uh, we were then all retrenched in 2000 and there was further exploration in uh, 2001 to 2003. As I say, nothing new was added. Uh, when one went out on a visit to these, to CGG, the French company, the infrastructure, the, the planning and the logistics that went into a 3D seismic survey was incredibly impressive. Um, and uh, we, we had a visit from a lot of Anglo geologists to show this lot. This was taken in about July that year. And then with Harmony, I went back basically re-logging, re-correlation of stratigraphy. Um, we then took the ball called data structure, constructed a geological model. And then we had also a major reinterpretation of structure using the seismics. And then revisions to the Dreyer scale and Kimberley stratigraphy by a, an ex-Lorraine geologist who sort of lifted the fog on our thinking and then we were able to improve the models of the central RAND group. Okay, I'm gonna go very quickly through the slot. Um, during this time, um, well, in the Vanda Union Corp made the discovery, four mines were developed over time. It's a mature gold field. Most shafts are closed. There are quite a few projects in the area there, 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 and there's a Vanda South sitting there. These, some of these are, are, are shallower than a thousand meters. Um, but again, the decision to proceed, from what I can gather, has been um, um, has not been made. Obviously, a great deal of capex. Uh, Burnstone again, Union Corp, um, and then Gen Gold did a lot of drilling. South Gold, Anton Esterhaz and acquired it. They drilled some boreholes. Uh, Burnstone has similarities to Vanda. It was taken over by a great basin gold. I was involved with the drilling and I just say this tongue in cheek. We didn't really do much to understand um, the reef. A lot of sampling and logging and no other than a foot. Great basin started a mine there, I believe something like $800 million was, was spent. Uh, things went wrong and it was taken over by, or well, the mine was stopped. It was taken over by Bits Gold. And then Bits Gold was taken over by Sibanyi Stillwater. So he has a, another project in Limbo. Again, Union Corp uh, started looking south of, of the existing Free State Goldfields. You'd say they end somewhere there. And they did a lot of drilling over many years. Uh, this led to, firstly, um, ISO mine being started on Europe, on the Ada May Reef, uh, primarily for uranium, but the uranium price tanked. And then some years ago, it was after that, it was reopened as Bicer. And then Witz Gold um, explored ground around um, the, Beat, the Great Beatrix Joel uh, lease areas. That's Joel there, that's Beatrix there. And with Subani Stillwater having quite a lot of ground around here that they could use to expand production and seek new shafts. But again, as Neil Furnerman has said uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago and on previous occasions, no further investment. So, okay, um, just from the Subani Stillwater um, resources and reserves statement last year, uh, the north end of Beatrix. Uh, there is what well, Beatrix um, four shaft uh, previously, Oryx previously, ISA. Uh, incredible amount of drilling has been done here. Um, 
and these are the blocks of ground that are potentially uh, exploitable by Sibanye. Uh, as I said, everything in Limbo right now. Okay, the 90s we saw the start of the decline of the gold mines. Reserves were being depleted. Production was, re re was reduced. Start of retrenchments. Um, I think some of the mines are seriously overstaffed. And obviously this had an impact on businesses. Uh, then the gold price sort of went down even further into the, uh, the, the 2000s. And then the start of Harmony acquiring old or ex Anglo American and Goldfields mines. And then the, the consolidation of mine companies or individual mines into Avgold, Anglo Gold. But in the 90s, just to summarize here, um, Avgold developed Target, it was further drilling north of Target. Great Basin acquired Burnstone. Uh, Ritz Gold was formed, it acquired a lot of data from Anglo, Goldfields, Harmony. And they looked at the areas around Beatrix and then Potch Gap, uh, southeast of the Clarksville Goldfields, et cetera. Ritz Gold also got involved in the Sand River. The company was listed. Uh, once the mine Burnstone failed, it was taken out by Blitz, um, Gold. Then Blitz Gold was acquired by um, Sibanye. Um, and then Anglo Gold, it was reported about three months ago, they, all their boil core reports, etc., are available now to interested parties and will be a, an interesting exercise to review these um, archives. Uh, the several companies have been pottering around in the bits. Um, I'm not going to go into this in any detail. Um, again, I don't think there's been any uh, sign of movement to start operations. I think one of the things that have led to the decline in interest in the bits, uh, safety record, I'm not going to go through this in too much detail. Uh, the Vol Reefs disaster in 95, where the loco and man carriages went down the shaft and there were more than 100 killed, led to the new Mine Safety and Health Act. And of course, uh, the use of Section 54 sometimes to close down uh, shafts uh, on spurious grounds. Uh, I've seen that in action. And then also a little bit of a political agenda. Okay. Um, Implications of the illegal mining. I think uh, everyone is fairly aware of the slot. Uh, okay, on the central rand, it's quite easy um, from outcrop. I think there's a very good reason for it. The economic downturn, people need to get money to live on. Serious safety issues. A lot of people underground or have worked underground and have died. It's just not known. Uh, people on surface have damaged and destroyed infrastructure by working fines from old gold plants, dumps, etc. Zamas get underground. Um, this apparently is a recently um, discovered problem where they get access cards to get into the mine infrastructure. They're pretty brutal. Uh, people have been killed. Attacks on the MET plants. Uh, people are making money and getting food, etc. underground. As I said, really death toll not known. Um, mining staff threatened. Theft of cable, steel, etc. Uh, one comp problem there is a result of sterilization of mining resources, as headgears, etc., are demolished. And then one notorious gang leader was sentenced to life imprisonment recently for murder. Um, he was a fairly brutal in, um, individual. This type of report in the local newspaper is fairly commonplace. The date here was 16th of July, and uh, these bodies were recovered from uh, its Elon shaft, um, uh, 10 of these individuals. Uh, a lot of them are recovered with no names, but somehow these guys were, were, had name tags on them. Okay, what didn't help uh, the overall image of the, of the gold mining industry? Uh, the, the failure of the Mary Spray Slimes Dam in 94, and one of the issues there that came out, the cost cutting led to experienced staff leaving the company and inexperienced staff being left to maintain the Slimes Dam. 
Okay, Sintolina was a mine that was a major gold producer and was eventually shut down. Uh, it fell foul of the Gen Gold Goldfields merger. A lot of staff were, were retrenched, development fell behind, uh, it led to a major fall in production. Um, the mine was sold to Harmony, it was closed down. Again, the Zama problem, um, winders, head, yeah, steel, etc., sold. Demolition of surface infrastructure. It was a major area there that could have been mined. And as I said in my last point here, yeah, there are a number of similar areas where in other gold fields where mining has been stopped with the, uh, the infrastructure has been removed. Uh, this is not an inconsequential block of ground. Uh, ten shafts sits there, four shafts there, eight shafts. You've got front fire there, and um, there's a lot of ground here that could have been mined. But, you know, I think that's just a consequence of the situation in this country. Future investments, well, or, or developments, Burnstone, they've got a decline, they've got a shaft, they've got a bed plant, could be developed. Okay, that's within Sibonye, so is Beatrix. Target North Sun South, how many said about a month ago, no more investment opportunities. Oroby, one ball, I don't think anyone's going to run with that. How many of the two miners they've acquired in Bening and Moab Kutsong? Uh, a lot of capex there to go deeper. Gold one, Fentersburg, Shallow Airy, I don't think anything's happening there. Pan African Resources, Evander, I don't think much is going to happen there. Negative factors, uh, this is my view. The share discount, and I think deep level single reef labor intensive mines past their sell by date risks. Many of them, the ESG factors, the mining charter, the government, well, the DMRE, the BE, et cetera, the problems with the cadastral and getting expiration permits issued. If anyone had to start a deep level mine, wrong lead times, high capex, uh, you know, when are these, when there going to be a return on investment? And if anyone saw Richard Quest's comments at Davos this year, uh, open for business, but and I think we are, I don't need to repeat that. I think we're all aware of these problems. Uh, the labor unions, etc., Eskom, legal mining. I think a lot of people have left overseas, mines not operating at full capacity. Again, the wage increases. In, and then something that's becoming increasingly elevant, uh, evident lately, the interested and affected persons, communities, pressure groups, lawyers, uh, local communities' expectations, try to stop, prevent mining operations. And there's an issue down in KwaZulu Natal with a colliery there. Um, anyone's interested, just go look on miningmx.com. Um, and then other factors, which I'd rather not put in the public domain. Uh, Pierre Sond recently on Kitco, was a guy with that uh, royalty um, company, Franco Nevada, speculated that the gold price could reach $20,000 an ounce. Uh, can't remember the time frame, but uh, as I say, could this gold price impact on the decisions for investing in South Africa? Uh, I think that's a bit too speculative now. As I come to the end here, this is some work done by McCarthy and uh, quite a number of guys. It shows there the extent of the Vitz Basin, as we knew up to fairly recently. Goldfields, Anglo and Gencore drilled in the Bethium area. I don't have too much information there. And then drilling carried on in this area has outlined that there is a central RAND group, i.e. <coughs> the sequence of rocks that hosts the gold reefs in the main bits basin. Um, I don't really think anyone's going to be interested there now. Okay, as that, oh, sorry. As we come to the end of this pre presentation, I think we can accept that there's going to be no further uh, shaft sunk or extension of mining um, activities. Uh, obviously, the further decline in gold production. And this is just my view in five years what could be left South Deep, Moab, Mpaneng, Beatrix, and the other day with Montoshi's Antics, Beatrix uh, 
says that they've only got six to eight years left. Kluft, Riefontein, Chapong, in 10 years, that's my best get, guess at this stage. So um, I thank you for listening to that part. I just want to go over to uh, Barberton. I don't want to spend too much time there. Barberton Greenstone Belt, uh, significant, had a number, has got a number of mines operating. Gold discovered there in 1885, Sheba gold mine. Uh, the original golden quarry, um, which sort of really opened up Barberton, is quite close by here. Mine's been going since 1885. <coughs> I think we're all familiar with uh, the Barberton geology. I think it must be one of the best exposed, best developed greenstone belts in the world. Uh, uh, brief history, August Robert found gold, golden quarry. The report is that there was gold wrapped around rocks. A major gold rush, prospectors were, had it easy. They could uh, recover three million gold. Then as they got to the uh, base of the oxidized zone, it all became refractory. Obviously there was a change there. In ETC, Eastern Transvaal Consolidated Mines on the Angle Wall, uh, they used to have to roast the, the, the ore. Uh, so they then took over uh, Fairview, so they had access to the IOX uh, technology. <coughs> Sorry. And then, of course, they also had the, the problem with illegal miners, and I believe Pan African Resources has uh, managed to contain that. Uh, Sheba Consort, Fairview, and Galaxy, previously Agnes. Um, mines have been around for a long time. A lot of exploration in the 70s into the 90s. Engelwald, ETC, opened Princeton, but then closed. I never found out why. Grand Mines opened Barbrook. It was also closed. And Eastern Goldfields, um, Conjuan Lily. As I say, the plus factors, the Barberton Greenstone Belt, superlative Greenstone Belt, highly prospective for gold. There's an awful lot of research. And according to uh, Anhauser and um, Ian, uh, what's his name, Ian Ward, there are more than 250 known as uh, surface outcrops of gold, which all are potentially targets. Okay, um, as I've said, the application of modern geoscience technology could aid discovery. I've been following companies in the Otavi mountain land in Namibia. And a lot of discoveries have been made. This is ideal terrain for juniors. Current situation, I'm not too sure of in terms of exploration. And there's all the necessary infrastructure that could support mining. Uh, the regulatory situation, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. There's supposedly a World Heritage site being um, declared. I cannot find any details. There have been problems, in my experience, between the national and provincial governments with environmental affairs, water, uh, forestry. They've thrown a curveball now with the Forestry Act, and there's ground being held by some companies, and there's no work being done there. Anyway, that ends my con my two presentations. I, oh, sorry, I've run over a bit of, quite a bit of time there. Um, hopefully, there are some questions now. Thanks, Graham. Okay, everyone can can open their mics and um, put their videos on so we can see one another and have some some questions and discussion. Get some can of the. I saw it, John. Hmm? Okay. Can I start? Yeah, Morning, everybody. Great talk, Graham. Excellent. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I made a copious notes while you were talking. There are lots of things that. You should come and visit me at my house. If you look over my head, and you'll see there's a large microscope. And I spent a lifetime working on the bits, and I was part of the basin analysis team at Anglo. And then subsequently did a lot of other stuff with them. But one of the interesting points you alluded to is gold losses underground. Probably spent most of my career, early career working on those, those, those things. And the thing that came out most, and probably would have cost me my job if I'd opened my mouth too often, was a lot of the mine core factors figures were actually fabricated. Um, and then there was the additional problem that the sampling, a grade control sampling on most of the mines was 
poorly managed and poorly controlled. And in many cases, were hopelessly inadequate. And the losses on blasting and liberation alone on mines like Wall Reefs was anything up to 40%, depending on the slope, depending on the thickness of the carbon seam. Um, the, uh, uh, there were several free state mines as well. The carbon seam was so thick, the thicker the carbon seam, um, the, the higher the mine core factor. And we went back underground on many occasions and we swept up the, uh, the, 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 the football. And in one instance, we got 70 grams a ton in a kilogram bag of samples to swept off the floor. So you can well imagine how much gold is left underground just from blasting alone. Yeah. So in other words, we should be blaming you geologists for the Zama Zamas being able to go back and remine these mines. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Keith, your comments are so pertinent. Um, I agree with you with uh, particularly the, the, well, I believe poor uh, drilling techniques where in many instances they were drilled diagonally down through um, from above the carbon seam through the carbon seam. Obviously, with that scenario, you, you blow the bottom contact to smithereens. Uh, recovery, again, uh, my experience at Hodebius Fontaine, a major problem. Sampling varied a lot between uh, samplers. I don't believe there was adequate uh, supervision and training. I think there were a lot of shortcuts. Um, water jetting, I think, was a, a major, well, it might have shifted the rock easily, but I think there was an awful lot of gold missed. And I know at one point at Hodebius Fontaine, I think it was 95, 96, uh, the, the mine core factor deteriorated to, I think it was 65%. And it's more than 65%. John? Are you there? John James? And for Okay, dude, someone else had um, had a comment there. I was Richard. I was going to just comment how much is on the metallurgical side how I concur with the mine core factor numbers, because when some of the mine managers got really desperate, they'd come and mine the plant and wander around all day telling us we'd lost the material, <laughs> and they never found it. Um, it also, on that um, blasting underground. I, involved in a project where we were looking at um, solution mining underground. It started off in the 80s when um, thiosulfate was, came as an alternative cyanide. We actually at Westry we went as far as putting a, a small pilot plant together to treat um, solutions from underground, but it didn't work very well and subsequent to work in, done in Australia. And, um, we understand the chemistry now that we didn't at the time. Um, I've always still been pretty keen on us being able to do something. And, and in that period, I certainly saw what the miners had left behind in really West Reefontein, large rock bits of reef left, left underground. The pr main problem with that technology is that the solution just disappears. And that's all in your fields. But um, I mean, anybody thought about it anymore? I know Goldfields, um, the new Goldfields had a go at it, but I'm not sure how far that went. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Richard. Four tenders you've done left. He said that uh, the, uh, the paleo current uh, measurements are key to the visit paleo places, transfer fans, and channel systems. Um, one just wonders, you know, how accessible these records are, and uh, you know, maybe it's a topic for another for another time. And I'll come on to Henny. Yeah, go, Keith. Uh, if, you, if you can see over my shoulder, if I move back, um, I'll unmute my, I should unmute my video. Okay, if you look over my shoulder there, you'll see a microscope. There's a large microscope in my office. Put, put, put your uh, video on, Keith. I've got a sensation We, we need your video to be able to look over your shoulder, Keith. Uh, sorry, uh, it, it, it is well, okay, can you see? Oh, what, what, no. uh, Okay, let me go there. There we go. It won't un video. It won't un look. If you lock my video, Henny, by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> no, it is blocked. The videos are blocked by. Okay. The host. Okay, I leave my video on. But behind me is a microscope, and I've got a huge collection. And one of the things with the bits is that 
the origin of the gold is actually a mystery. It's a huge mystery. I've been a hydrothermalist for over 30 years, but even that I'm starting to doubt. And I'll tell you why. I've done a lot of work of the inside of the reef. In other words, where the carbon seam is. And it's, it is an effect there that's a huge shock. In other words, there's a thin section, I have a thin section where the pebbles have been destroyed by the carbon seam. And where there's no carbon seam, the pebbles are totally unaffected. And in the plane, and in the plane of the of the of the of the carbon seam um, are monstrous amount of fluid inclusions. They are just thousands and thousands, They're very, very small. And we've done a lot of geochemistry on those things. And now I'm starting to, to get strange phenomena like inside that carbon seam zone, the rare earth profile is interesting in that it's extremely enriched in the heavy earths, which indicates a possible mantle source for that particular plane. Also, oil may contain enrichment to rare earths, but nothing as steep as this. I've got a lot of data, a huge amount of geochemistry. We sampled something like two kilometers of raised lines every 50 meters in detail. And we sampled every single analysis and we analyzed for everything, something like 62 elements. And this data I have, no one else has it. When I left Anglo Gold, I took it with me because no one understood it. And I've been looking at this data and there's some really interesting phenomena. Enrichment in things like uh, 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 selenium, a rare, strange elements which you've never known before. And later on, I'll give a talk on this, but the point I want to make is that neither the placer nor the hydrothermal theory actually can be answered, answers every question. And we're needing another approach. And this is what I'm trying to do, to try and understand what put this, these gold deposits in place and why they're so unique. Oh, good points. Okay, yeah. who, who else has got questions there? We've got a comment here from John Simonis who says, why not just try and organize the Zamas? By buying their gold, uh, they see the potential we've missed and are doing it cheaply, help them with safety. Um, yeah, Henny, it, it, it's a very valid point, Henny, and it's getting to the rest of this country that, you know, we have all these remarkable entrepreneurs and wheeler dealers and, you know, no, 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 no reason to observe the law. But they, you know, they survive and it's in every aspect of our society and somehow we should be using those, um, that creativity and those entrepreneurs in, in, in a better way or a more constructive way if you want to be perfectly brutal and honest, in my opinion. Uh, to be very honest with you, maybe Central ran, but uh, some time back I picked up some interesting uh, sort of news clips on YouTube where these reporters have actually gone into these underground workings. And I'll tell you what, uh, from a safety point of view, these guys are taking major chances with their lives. Um, I think we have seen on the news, particularly on the East Rand, where they've had disasters, where they've had to call out mine proto teams to try and rescue uh, guys who are trapped, bring out bodies, um, I don't think it is, um, from a safety point, feasible. Um, as I said earlier, somehow these guys have done this simply to earn money to basically survive, keep their families going. Uh, the problem in the free state as well is that they are causing havoc with existing mines, um, of the mining operations. Uh, sort of where the point where people underground have been threatened not to interfere with the Zomas uh, working there. And it has been reported at times that some of these Zomas, uh, uh, this probably a sort of change house gossip, but they reckon some of these guys have spent up to a year underground. Uh, it might be well intentioned, but I think um, it's just too risky. I think for these poor guys, I mean, I've got compassion for them that they have to do this. But I think there are too many issues um, involved. And I think also it's been mentioned or sort of suggested that this whole chain of producing gold by Zomers uh, are controlled by, by major crime syndicates. And I don't really think if the SAPS has really got to grips of the higher levels of this gold, uh, higher, uh, gold sale, gold recovery hierarchy. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and I mean the, the syndicates are in every every part of our society, Graham, and it's no different to the the parliament and the poaching that goes on here, you know, blatantly along the along our coastline. Um, but 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 let's let's just turn let's just turn the discussion okay. around. I mean, assuming and, and and just so we have this remarkable resource which still exists down there. If if you had and, and a policy environment and an enabling environment and a situation, you know, with government and, <coughs> and policy makers today, they wanted to, you know, develop and encourage the development of this resource and create jobs. And we put all the, the technology to, to proper use. And I mean, surely, surely we could still have a, have a growth sector. Um, obviously, as you've pointed out, there's still big areas that are quite shallow, that, that could be mined. Um, so, you know, that, that's my first question. Um, but, that, but then you need a particularly enabling environment. You've also got to get a go, go and get a whole lot of your skills, you know, your skills back into the business because probably as we've seen in Zimbabwe, the biggest challenge today in South Africa, and we in Hamana see that amongst all the retirement villages is all our, all our youth have left the country. So unless you can rebuild the skills and stop that skills drain, you know, we have a, another challenge. But do you think, Graham, we could um, reinvent this industry in the right environment? Oh, definitely, yes. I think it requires a major uh, mindset change by the government um, all the way down through the DMR and E. Um, yes, I believe with the right environment, Burnstone could probably be brought into production fairly quickly. Uh, they've got a met plant, they've got a decline, they've got a shaft. Um, one, well, this is what I heard through the grapevine, that it, the Kimberley Reef in the Burnstone area is at times not very well developed. Um, and from what I understand, uh, the guys intersected uh, what is the leader reef a couple of meters above the Kimberley and because this looked like genuine reef they started mining that and there's no gold in it. Now I've never been able to confirm uh, uh, that that actually happened. Um, as I say it is shallow. I, I know some of the shallowest reef intersections we saw was 200 meters below the surface and down to a thousand meters. I believe that is eminently uh, suitable for, for mining. Uh, the shallower you are uh, the less, the fewer rock mechanic, rock engineering problems you have. You need less support. I think ventilation is easier. I think a similar situation exists um, in the Sand River area, particularly around Beatrix. That I think some of the resources there are available for less than a thousand meters. Again, I mean, that's, so, so you've answered the question. Let's get some other right. comment, Adrian. I mean, you've I, been in the business too. I mean, for comment. Can I just? So the, the, um, the, we're touching it out on the shallow reef in the historic um, mining basin around Johannesburg. I, I see there's a new company, Shallow Reefs Gold, has formed to look at some of these um, near surface at one yeah. areas um, yeah. and others. I just wonder if you've got any comments on that one because that's quite, yeah, I thought it was all worked out. Okay, well, Adrian, you've um, been in the business. You've developed mines. Could you redevelop the vits? Um, yeah, it's an interesting thing, John. And um, just to talk about Burnstone quickly, it's low grade, it's channelized Kimberley reefs. I think there's a lot of issues in getting sort of major production out of there. Um, Graham's quite right. The, the, the single reef mines, particularly the thin ones, even if they're high grade, are always going to be a problem. Um, I'm very doubtful that those if, if the bits hadn't been discovered until now, and we had current day um, legislation, they'd probably never be developed. Yeah. If we had good legislation, they would be developed, but I think safety aspects and costing, labor costing, you know, if, if people yeah. always talk about, you know, the old days, gold price was $35 an ounce and so on, but you would pay a rand a day for a man to go 2,000 meters down and, and extract gold. Ah, oh, oh, no. You can't bring that kind of thing into the current day. Um, so, so, yeah. Carry on. So, so the big chance is the, 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 big, the, the big thick packages, the 50 meter, 200 meter thick packages, 
And as Graham has pointed out, there's a lot of those still around. But when you look at South Deep and you look at the billions that have been poured into that by a succession yeah. of different mining companies, and you know, maybe it's turning the corner now, but I've heard that turning the corner over the last 15 or so years. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there's much that could be done with the bits. Um, mm. I, I, you know, apart from the massive capital development and the fact the government is not going to ever, I think, bring in the right sort of um, attitude to, to, to mining those deposits. I don't have a lot of optimism, um, but um, that's me. Okay. Uh, can, I touch, can, can I touch on something? Yeah. Uh, I can't put my video yeah. on, but maybe that's a blessing in disguise. No, that's good, Clyde. We, we like the good looks, look, good looking guy that you are. Carry on. Okay, it says I can't start my video. I just want to mention that it hasn't been mentioned at all that I think the uh, some of the best opportunities yeah. are, are to use the infrastructure that's in place on some of the mines that have shut down. So all of these mines have got good electrical infrastructure coming into them, or they certainly used to have if it hasn't already been scavenged. They've got water. Um, and uh, you're all probably aware that we're sitting with an electricity crisis in South Africa. We need to build eight gigawatts of solar a year in South Africa, starting tomorrow, going on forever. And a lot of these old mine sites have got uh, a transmission infrastructure in place and are ideally suited to, to make use of that existing transmission and distribution infrastructure to become the sites of basically massive solar plants. And so I would say that there needs to be some focus on <coughs> taking the mines that probably haven't got a good chance and re-establishing some form of law and order there via using the existing infrastructure to produce uh, solar energy. At the same time as then, uh, if one gets step changes in, in, in law and order, uh, I'd rather be a zama zama cleaning solar panels than going to spending a year underground <laughs> cobbling away at a missing reef. So, my suggestion is that the industry should recognize its, its old age, if I could call it that, uh, however much we like to cling on to the past, and it should be starting to look at um, holistically closing that cycle, getting back uh, respect, if you like, getting back law and order, and then evaluating which deposits, if any, are worth uh, still uh, pursuing. Yeah, thanks. Good comments. But again, I think um, you'd agree we do it and you said it, we need a good strong police force and we need law and order. So we need, you know, good, good um, leadership and policy. Um, <laughs> Peter, Peter van der Spey, I mean, you've had a lifetime and successful exploration and mining. Your comments? Are you there? Peter? No, lost him. Bill, you got any comments? You, 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 you've made some similar comments from a diamond point of view to what Adrian just made. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, if we let, let's assume that something can be done in the bits, what you need to do, you, you can't get away from the depth. Um, I think Adrian spoke about you need the big packages or, or whatever. I agree. It's a good start. But problem is, uh, for anyone wanting to invest, it's going to take you a number of years to put an investment plan together. Then you have to drill it out, do lots of work, um, maybe take another, let's say, five years. You've got 10 years of exploration investment before you even get around to a feasibility study. Our mineral legislation is so set up <clears throat> that you've got a limitation on, um, uh, on, on mining, mining lease, 30 years. Um, 
you know, if, if you're going to be, the, 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 the Vitz was exploited over a period of, well, still being exploited over yeah. 140 years after it was discovered. Um, the bulk of the major uh, production was created by, uh, was produced by major companies that had long lives in excess, some of them uh, 80 years, uh, at least 50 years. You know, you, you got to have government that has got that kind of type of vision about certain, you know, about the mineral industry. Um, I think, you know, if you look at the current situation, right, I, I, I was invited to a gold conference in Ghana in March, and I went there. It was about artisanal mining. But the, um, in preparing for the presentation, I looked at annual reports from all the gold majors. And in Australia, uh, one ounce, of, you, you get 472 ounces of gold for one employee in Australia. Mm. In North America, in South America, and in Africa, outside South Africa, you get about a hundred and between a hundred and a hundred and fifteen ounces of gold per employee. In South Africa, you get forty ounces per employee. Mm -hmm. There's no yeah. gold mining in Ghana because that's what the conference was about. It produces about eight ounces of gold per artisanal digger. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it just you know. It, it, the, there's much more to this than just the regula you know, the regulation. You've got to completely rebuild a new industry. You're going to have to find a government that's got a vision of being prepared to release things uh, to get back to where we were, to a situation where a mining company could explore. It would have the immediate right to, uh, to exploit its discovery, and it would own the mineral lease, no government involvement. Government can have a share, but you need outright ownership. And you shouldn't be asking uh, government ministers for permission to sell a stake in your mine to somebody else and so yeah. on. So without, those, with, without those enabling factors, I just can't see that anyone, any company in the right mind would want to invest in mining and in the, in, in the Vitz gold as things stand at the moment. So for me, I think, you know, if, we, if we're going to be trying to tout that, we've got to get messages out that are, you know, huge gold resources potentially available. Some of them, the style of mineralization may not be suitable, but the style of mineralization is maybe we're hearing uh, from, from Gavin, maybe it's a figment of our imagination as geologists, you go through periods of saying, this is the paradigm, this is what the gold, this is what the gold mineralization is about. Is it hydrothermal? Is it sedimentary? Is it something else? As Keith is saying, we just don't know. But no one is going to invest in, in, in trying to understand that without the enabling environment being there. And then if, if someone, if this guy in Canada is right, gold goes to $20,000 an ounce. Well, there'll be a huge amount of inflation throughout the world and so on, you know, to, to, to create that. But if it does, it, it creates a whole new uh, situation with regard to how these things will, will develop. But all of us sitting here, or well, most of us are probably, you know, such an age that we'll never see that because the be gone gone before the exploration can be carried out but it needs to be you know it needs to be said it needs to be done and, and we need to get aggressive with this these types of ideas otherwise yeah, you're going to turn it around yeah agreed hmm. yeah, very good. Oh. okay P peter van der Spey, have you got any comments can you hear me yes um the only comment i have is I, I agree with uh, Bill McKechnie and all of the other speakers. Um, and I think everybody has a common view that there is potentially something that could be done, but it has to start by changing the, the, the political environment. 
And short of that, people will go continue to go elsewhere. And that is the great sadness for South Africa. Mm. Yeah. What Thank about you. the unspeakable uh, reality of state-owned mines and state-driven exploration into which people then later buy them? Because that's where the, where the money is. Well, we have a state-owned electricity commission. <laughs> we and had a, an airline. As I'm saying, it's unspeakable, but you know, it's something that one has to look at in terms of isn't isn't that the only hope that's left? Well, we had a state-owned diamond field once. Hmm. Can I just so comment. Go. go for it, John. Can I? One of the issues that you didn't really address, Graham, is. Um, the sort of SAMREC codes which now exist for, in, for investment in a mine. Um, we, uh, hold on, I'll start my video. We, um, when you look at things like mines like Jeanette, which was started on one borehole, and uh, even Western Deep Levels, which was started on a few boreholes, they would never have passed the current SAMREC rules because their net present values wouldn't have been sufficient to to make them viable for, for investors. Um, there's plenty of gold, but um, the rules have changed financially as well as, as well as in terms of what's wrong with government or, or, or the, the government in infrastructure. It's also the financial infrastructure. A lot of this started in the 90s with the London Stock Exchange when, after, when, when they started changing the rules for, for how, how many holes you had to drill, what a feasibility project was, and that sort of uh, that, that, all those aspects. Would you like to comment on that? Uh, well, look, all the resources that I quoted there are all pre-2000 when SAMREC came into existence. Um, I know there was uh, some discussion when I was with Harmony, but I'd rather not sort of go into detail because I have an NDA in place. Um, yeah, I did make a comment there that um, uh, my belief is, and I think Adrian made the point as well, is that um, if the current regulatory environment, the codes, uh, the, uh, the resource codes plus the JSC listing requirements, I think probably would have been far too onerous. Um, in terms of target sun, I think there, in some areas they could probably get a fairly reliable resource out. Um, elsewhere, really, I, I just don't think they can put in anything with confidence. RB one ball um, with Blayfoot was one ball, I think, Adrian, that started that mine. Um, you know, I think we passed those days. I think uh, what I understand, investors like a lot less risk these days. Can I add something, possibly? Yeah, please, Stephen. Um, fantastic to see you again, and uh, really nice uh, to hear about all the old and of all exploration guys. Uh, it's a really, really great talk. I just wanted to add a little bit from my experience with uh, GenCorp, and uh, sort of another little aspect that goes into the demise of the industry is, is um, South African companies weren't really welcome elsewhere in the world or in Africa before about 1990. And thereafter, the, the companies, the majors themselves were looking at where else can we get a better deal in the rest of the world. Um, and so they started looking around. And but what happened with, with us in Genco is, is people exploded everywhere, Indonesia, China, South America, looking all around the world. And um, then Brian Gilbertson started doing this deal with Bulletin. And, and Bulletin, obviously, are not South African. They were the old Shell Mineral Division. And they looked at, from a sort of objective view from the outside. And what happened is that Bulletin decided that they're very interested in this deal, but they're not interested in deep level, narrow, high labor intensive operations. So when the deal was eventually done, and uh, Gencore managed to <laughs> basically sneak out of South Africa and get a new name and a London head office under the title Bulletin. They ex excluded the platinum, which got listed into Impala Platinum. And basically, Gen Gold 
and all the fabulous tradition of union corporation and general mining got uh, put packaged into, into gold fields. So that's just another little angle on the story. Yeah, yes. you're right. It was the big exit strategy that I guess many of the companies, you know, pursued. Some openly, some surreptitiously. Sort of came the change in politics, and of course, it was also around. I guess you know that time when the whole mineral legislation, um, white paper or green paper, white paper, um, MPRDA came about, and and again, you know, that spooked lots of lots of long-term investors. Thanks. All right. Any last comments, questions for Graham? Yes, yes, uh, John. Just one, Graham. Yeah. Do you know where I get some samples of diesel oil or oil, please? I would like one or two samples. Um, I don't actually know anyone directly uh, at Vicer at the moment. I could make some inquiries, but it would take a bit of time. That's okay. I, I tell you why. One of my, uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to do some work uh, on the uranium isotopes in the uraninite. And so it means actually take the uraninite out and doing isotope work on it. Because um, I want to see if the fissile component of our uraninite indicates uh, an artifact of a shock. And that requires individual grains to be taken out and, and the uranium isotopes analyzed. So I need so almost like get my hands on them. Yeah. Well, I'll see what I can do. Good to see you're still doing some proper R&D, Keith. Maybe you'll find an extension of the Vitsia to write. Anyone else? Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Henny, for again driving the show. Thanks, um, everyone who's contributed. Um, thanks, Graham, for a, an interesting talk. Um, we, we, we probably need to come back to the small gold mines and the potential that, that might exist there. Um, we'd, we've had one or two talks, including by Adrian, on you know, some of our smaller deposits. And, and is there life there that we could probably unlock and create some jobs? Um, and, and again, and we'd, we'd certainly welcome um, comments, um, suggestions about future talks, and, and most of all, um, if people have got ideas and, and talks that they'd like to give, we, we welcome you. Um, Peter, I think you've probably got my emails this morning, so we're looking, to, uh, looking forward to a, a presentation from you, that's Peter van der Spey, talking about some of your great successes in the past. Right, that's all for me. Thanks, everyone. Um, enjoy your weekend, and we look forward to seeing most of you again next week.